Hello Brotherhood of Darkness and welcome to the slightly darker side of my channel. Here we will explore stories of intense, well, gore mainly, but all these different types of things will be read in this side of the channel. And to start it off I decided I would do a classic and a well known one called the Russian Sleep Experiment. So let's dim the lights and without further ado, let's get started. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based simulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed-circuit cameras, so they had only microphones and five-inch thick glass portal-sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on but no bedding, running water and a toilet, and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects had hardly complained, having been promised, falsely, that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasing traumatic incidents in their past and the general turn of their conversations took a dark aspect after the fourth day mark. After five days they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and, start, and began to whisper alternatively to the microphones and the one-way mirror portals. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other test subjects, in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repetitively yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He couldn't attempt to scream anymore and was only able to produce the occasional squeak. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about his behaviour is how the other captives reacted to it, or rather, didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The non-screaming captives took the book apart, smeared page after page with their own face, feces and pasted them calmly over the glass portals. The screaming promptly stopped, so did the whispering to the microphones. After three more days, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming from five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning on the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would never do. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives. They were afraid they were either, they were either dead or vegetables. They announced, we are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you'll be shot. The compliance will earn you, earn all of you your immediate freedom. To the surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice respond, We no longer want to be freed. The debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces, funding the research. Unable to provoke any more responses using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of all the stimulant and gas and filled with fresh air, and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging, as if pleading for their life or loved ones, to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened, and the soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers, when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive. 
although no one could rightly call the state that any of them in life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subject's thighs and chest, stuffed into the drain in the centre of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water, water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects had also large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth, as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. The abnormal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed. While the heart, lungs and dipahinga remained in place, the skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs to the ribcage. All blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the ever-secreted but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working digesting food. It quickly became apparent that they were digesting was one was their own flesh that they have ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian, special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternately begged and demanded that the gas was turned back on, at least they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives, if you count the ones that committed suicide in the following weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempt to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than 10 times the human dose of morphine, derivite, but still he fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arm of one of the doctors. When Hart was seen to beat, for a full two minutes after he bled out to the point there was no more air in his vascular system that bl than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone it reached and just repeat the word, more, over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. The two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for gas, demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back in within his body, it was found he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare for, for the surgery. He fought furiously against the restraints when the anaesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four-inch wide little strap on one wrist, even though the weight of a 200-pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anaesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had triple the normal levels of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn and he had broken nine bones and he struggled to be subdued. Most of them were from the force of his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of the five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed, he was unable to beg or object to surgery and he only reacted by shaking his head violently, violently in disapproval when the anaesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested reluctantly that they try the surgery without anaesthetic and did not react for the entire six hour procedure or replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. 
The surging presiding stated repeatedly that it should be shouldn't be medical possible for a patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl with a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk, while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched and the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two cess subjects were given the same surgery, both without anaesthetic as well. Although they had been injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation, the surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralysed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for simulant gas. The researchers tried to ask them why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped their own guts and why they wanted to be given the gas again. The only response that was given was, I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were forced and were placed back into a chamber, just awaiting to determine as to what should be done with them. The researchers, facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed to state the goals of the project, considered euthanizing. Sorry, about that. considering euthanizing the survival surviving subjects. The commanding officer of XKGB instead saw a potential and wanted to see what happened if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and they had restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going to go back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point, all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects could speak while hum <coughs> sorry, one of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against leather bonds with all his might, first left and then right, left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly, having been the first to be wired to the EEG. Most of the researchers were monitoring his brainwaves in surprise. They were normal, but most of the time, but sometimes flatlined in exability. It looked as if he was repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on the paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head at the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to the depths of silence. Silence. They flattened for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be still sealed in now. His brainwaves showed the same flatness as one who just died from falling asleep. The commanders gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes and turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed the, pointed the gun to the remaining subjects to restrain on the bed. As the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room, I won't be locked in here with these things. Not with you, he screamed. And at the man strapped on the table, What are you? he demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have they forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all. Begging to be free. At every moment in the depthest of your animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis. When you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flattened, so the subject weakly choked out. So nearly free.
I would like to thank you guys for watching this video. If you were creeped out or found yourself slightly disturbed, please give this a thumbs up and, a, and subscribe. I'm sorry that if this gives you nightmares in any way. If you want to read it for yourself, just hop on the Creepypasta wiki and search it up. And yeah, if you guys would like to suggest which one I should read next, please do. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.